90. Or if I gave you a 100 this time, you could turn in the same type of thing and you would probably get a 100 in the future. But if you got a 95 or a 90, I want you to work on um, changing some things. And I gave comments on almost every single person's stuff. If they were below a 100, I think I gave a comment on everyone. So um, if you got a comment, take that comment and use it to not get that great again, because it won't be so generous next time. I always have a policy of the first one being generous in case my rules weren't clear. But after that, it's like, I'm gonna grade you for the work you did because otherwise it's not fair for the students who did do the work. Okay, any questions on that? No, okay. So we have gone over the quit or the exam. You guys feel pretty good. It was about what you expected, nothing crazy. Um, we talked about what study techniques worked and didn't work for you. Um, how do you feel about the nomenclature stuff? Pretty good, okay. I had quite a few students in my office hours this morning, which I love, thank you for coming. I forgot, I was like, oh, I'm gonna change these to student drop-in hours and I didn't. <laughs> but clearly a lot of people are coming. So you know that you're welcome in my, <laughs> in my office hours, they're set aside for you to come. And um, there were a lot of questions that I think the students were having trouble just applying the rules to actual practice problems. So again, nomenclature is one where it's like, I can give you a list of rules, but until you practice it, it's not gonna be helpful. So I really, really want you to practice um, doing nomenclature. And so I've given you as many resources as I possibly can for that. One thing that did come up in office hours that I didn't realize I should have said is sometimes you'll see what are known as bicyclic molecules. Um, I'm not gonna test over that and neither will Dr. Berhey. Now, if you go somewhere else um, and you have a different uh, professor for this class, like if you go to a different university or if you're not taking a chemistry this summer, you might have someone who wants you to know about these things. I'm not one of those people and neither is Dr. Berhey, but um, it's once you get the basic nomenclature rules, it's actually really easy to teach yourself. But if you see anything like this, um, or like this, I'm not going to test you over that, and neither is Dr. Berhey. The rules are very easy to teach yourself if anyone else needs you to know. It's like once you've solidified the basics, but if you haven't solidified the basics, they just confuse people more. So I don't want to confuse you more until you solidify the basics. And also my philosophy on nomenclature questions is some professors will really nail you down on all these like little exceptions. That makes me so mad because you don't need to know all these little exceptions when you actually do research as an organic chemist. Like that tells me those professors have not actually been organic chemists before <laughs> because we need the basics to be able to communicate about the molecules that we're working with, but we don't need to be nailing you down on these little tiny things that will never come up. So if there's like a tiny rule that is confusing you, I'll usually clarify it but I don't want you to worry a ton about the tiny rules. I want you to get the basic uh, big picture ideas and be able to communicate in the language of organic chemistry. And that is my goal with nomenclature, not to confuse my students, not to test you on these little things that are never gonna come up, okay? Great, if I could skip nomenclature altogether, I absolutely would, but I can't do that because <laughs> unfortunately, we do use that as a language to communicate. It is important and we need it, but I am not gonna like nail you on these little things. Okay, any questions, like big picture questions on nomenclature? Okay, do a lot of practice problems. Now who watched the other videos that I posted? Nice, about the six membered rings and um, did I also do a Newman projection one? No, it was just about six membered rings. Okay, great. Well, we're gonna get into visualizing molecules today. I think it is gonna be um, a little bit challenging maybe if you're not used to visualizing 3D things, but um, we're gonna do lots of practice and you can get through it. And um, yeah, so I think let's just dive right in. This is where I think organic chemistry starts to be fun in a way and also hard in a way. So a lot of the stuff you've done up to this point was review of OCHEM1 stuff, but this is totally new. You've probably not done anything like this before. 
Okay, so we already did how to name no, no, molecules. I'm breaking this second part up into another chapter because it flows more into chapter five. So chapter 4.2, um, how molecules rotate and move. And then we're also going to talk briefly about hydrogenation. So um, oh, there's a typo right there. I might I imagine there's going to be a lot of typos. So two groups on a single bond can rotate. And you guys have seen this before. Um, and we've talked about this with cis trans bonds, right, is that they can't rotate. But if you're on a single bond, you can rotate. And that actually, but up to this point, we've been like, so all these molecules are the same because they can rotate. And that's true to an extent, but um, build this out for you. That's true to an extent, but actually the way they rotate, you're about to find out matters more than we thought. So just like in all classes, I taught you the basics and now I'm teaching you that I lied to you about it <laughs> because there's a much more in-depth story. I feel like that happens a lot. Math is like, it's this way. And then you're like, except in this case. And you're like, they told me that it wasn't that way. Okay. So imagine, if you will, this, or you don't have to imagine, I guess. Let's look at this 3D molecule. This will be a, um, actually, so this has two halide groups on it right? Two halogens, and these are hydrogens. The green things are halogens, the rest are hydrogens. Okay, so normally we would just draw this any old way, and it wouldn't matter. This is an ethane, so we could just draw it like this. Chlorine, or we could draw it like this, and all these are the same. There's no cis-trans that happen in um, single bonds because it can rotate, right? So this is like, it doesn't really matter at all. But actually, it does matter in real life if this was an actual molecule that you could visualize because if we look at it from this angle, as you can see, this chlorine and this chlorine with both, both have a pretty good cloud of electrons around them are really close together. And we know that electrons don't like to be close to each other. So this confirmation is what this is called. It's the arrangement of molecules is actually pretty high energy. Like it's hard for these two to be near each other. You have to really force them together. Like when you have two negative magnets and you're pushing them together and they're resisting. Have you guys tried that? You know, that's kind of what's happening here. And so the force of the resisting actually is a lot to take. So it would be better if you rotated one molecule and it was slightly off kilter. So they're not directly next to each other. And then it would be even better if you rotated it and they're completely opposite of each other. And then just these baby hydrogens are the things that are going to be near the bigger molecules on each other side. So the way that a molecule rotates around like this and the different 3D arrangements it can take in shape are actually called conformation. Um, and the different like positions, this position or this position, those are called conformers. Okay. So um, I wanted you to just have a visual. So confirmations are the temporary shape from rotation and the individual confirmations are called a conformer. Like this conformer, we could compare to that. So the one where the two chlorines were close together, you could compare to the ones where the two chlorines are opposite and that's a conformer. Uh, and then conformational analysis is actually, we kind of just did that a little bit. Um, in an informal way where we talked about like, oh, if these two are closer together, that would be harder. So that's high energy. But if we could rotate it, it would be lower energy. So confirmational analysis, there's like a standard way to do it, but it's just reviewing the energy changes. So that's what we're going to talk about in the first half of this chapter four part. Um, and actually what I just showed you is called a Newman projection. So I talked a lot about how we're going to learn different ways to represent molecules, and I want you to be able to visualize molecules, and that's why we spent a lot of time on the shape at the beginning. That's what Newman projections are. They are a different way to visualize a molecule. So um, I'm going to draw this for you, and first I'm going to draw it in the wedge dash form because we haven't done a ton of that yet. But if I was drawing this in the wedge dash form, Remember this, um, the ones that are like flat are in the plane of the page. So this chlorine is in the plane of the page. So I'm gonna draw it straight up. And this um, hydrogen down here, uh, let's do it like this. 
this fluorine down here is also in the plane of the page. So there's a plane of, in the page where it's like fluorine, carbon, carbon, fluorine. Do you guys see that? Okay. Fluorine, carbon, carbon, fluorine. So that's our backbone. And then we have this hydrogen is coming towards us. Do you agree with that? Okay. So I'm going to make that a wedge. And this hydrogen is going back into the page. So I'm going to make that a dash. And then same thing here. This hydrogen is coming towards us. And this is going away. Oh, I forgot to put H's. I just made those into methyl groups. So we have one hydrogen coming towards us and one hydrogen going away. So that's the wedge dash notation of this. But if we turn this on its side, we can do another notation of this known as conformational analysis. And this is where I think your modeling kits really come in handy. And you can use the modeling kit on an exam, um, on any of your exams in my class and in Dr. Berry's class if we're taking some or two here. So strongly encourage that. So if we have this same molecule and we put it on its end, we're looking at it right now. Oh, here's a better way to draw it. This is our eyeball. Here's some eyelashes. Here's an eyebrow. That's our eyeball. If you want, you can make it into a whole face. That person has a scary face, but that's okay. Okay, um, so this is the angle that we're looking at it right now. If we were in the page, that's how we'd be looking at it. And we see that there's a hydrogen, a carbon in the middle, hydrogen on each side and a chlorine going straight down. And then to represent this carbon in the back, we actually draw a circle. So this line should be extending past the circle. And we show that there's a hydrogen bonded here and here, and a chlorine bonded up on top. Does that make sense? Okay, that's a Newman projection. And in this class, by the end of this chapter, I want you to be able to go from looking at the wedge dash notation to being able to draw the Newman projection. So you should be able to see this on the page and be able to recreate this by the end of the chapter. And we'll have practice problems on that in today's presentation. And then also um, your chapter practice problems will have some of these questions as well. Um, so you'll get a lot of practice on it. So I'm not gonna throw you just straight into it. Okay. So this Newman projection has the chlorine, the ethanol, so I'm going to represent ethanol with just, um, oh, I already have an ethanol. Perfect. Chlorine ethanol on the bottom. So you have to be able to recreate this in wedge dash notation, right? So we're looking at these two carbons in the middle. There's a hydrogen in the plane of the page. I'm going to draw it this way, actually, so you can see there's a hydrogen in the plane of the page. And then there's an ethanol coming, or an ethyl group, sorry, not ethanol, coming towards us. So, oh, I took off. There's our ethyl group. And then going into the page is our chlorine. So that's the first carbon. You see that? There's a hydrogen going up. There's an ethyl group coming towards us. I'll get rid of this hydrogen and make it easier to see. And there's a chlorine going into the page. Do you all agree with the carbon on the left? Okay. And the carbon on the right has an alcohol coming towards us. Alcohols are red. Nope, alcohol on the plane of the page, a hydrogen coming towards us, and a methyl group going back. Okay. So we have a hydrogen coming towards us in this one. We have a methyl group in the uh, going backwards and an OH in the plane of the page. Do you see that? Does everyone agree that that's what that is? Okay, great. So now, if you were looking at it, we're going to leave this here. If you're looking at it this direction, you need to be able to draw that Newman projection. So I want you all to try on your own to draw this Newman projection. Don't look at the notes for those of you who have the answer already. Actually, we could make it go the opposite way, but that's good. I think this was the angle they're looking at it for. Now we'd start with this. And this, if you don't know where to start, start with the front carbon and then start with the back carbon.
Wait, I think I did make that up though, Paul. <laughs> That's wrong. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. I made it wrong. That was a correct one. See, that's why we need another nomenclature. So you don't screw up like I just did. Or arguably, if that's a good reason to say. Maybe you don't even know, because even I screwed it up. All right, so what do you have pointing straight down on the front carbon? Alcohol, and what do you have on the left? A hydrogen, and what do you have on the right? Carbon, uh, yeah, CH3. Okay, and then the back carbon pointing straight up. Hydrogen on the left. Ethyl, and then on the right, I think it was chlorine. Okay, so the front carbon, H, CH3, and OH. I'm just gonna leave that CH3 as a line for bond line notation. And then on the back, we have an H, a CL, and an ethyl. Okay. Oh, they... They did flip it. Oh, whoops. So I I made you do it from the backward side. So if you were um, using the notes and cheating, you would have gotten that wrong. They actually were looking at it from this carbon, where the chlorine and the ethyl were on top. I wish I could like split screen this where I could have the notes and this up at the same time. I guess I could, but then it'd be like that side would get a better view than the other. Yes. Um, can you ask your question a slightly different way? Why did it What's this circle for? It's to represent the back carbon. So the front, this point in the middle is the front carbon right here. But if you're looking at it straight on, you can't see that back carbon. So we do a bigger circle to represent that that back carbon exists. Does that answer your question? So in the, the example that I gave you, I asked you to draw it looking from carbon uh, two on this side. And this was the answer we got. But in the uh, slides, they actually asked you to look from the other carbon. And this was the answer they got. It's the same. It's just from a different view, right? The hydrogen pointing straight up, the chlorine on the left, and the ethyl group on the right. Yes. My preference, I think, is for you to practice the bond line, but you won't get it wrong either way. So if the condensed formula makes more sense to you at this time, I'm fine with that. But I, if I had my choice, I guess, I would want people to write in bond lines so that they can practice it. That's a good question. Okay. So you guys kind of tracking with what Newman projections do. And in this case, I gave you like the intermediate of the molecule, but by the end of probably today, uh, I want you to practice doing it from the wedge dash notation. Okay, so these slides are just gonna kind of take you through and um, looking at it from one direction or the other and how that kind of shows the, um, the picture that I showed you already on the visualizer. Um, there's something known as staggered versus eclipsed. So when you can see all six of the substituents, when they're slightly off from one another, that's known as staggered. So like these are not covering each other up, so that's staggered. And usually in the two substituents that are in the plane of the page in the staggered conformation are exactly opposite of each other. So 180 degrees. Now, an eclipsed confirmation, that was the first one I showed you where the like the two chlorines were um, were hitting each other and they weren't happy. That's eclipsed. So all of the 
groups lining up like this is eclipsed, and then the groups being staggered is um, staggered. So which one do you think is more stable in general, the eclipsed confirmation of a molecule or the staggered confirmation of a molecule? That's right. Wow, you guys like all in unison said that. That's like my dream as an organic chemistry professor. Actually, my dream as an organic chemistry professor is for you guys to all do the my money don't jingle jingle dance with me because somebody did it on TikTok with his whole O time class. And I was like, that's my dream. Okay. Um, so you're right, eclipsed has a higher energy and staggered is more stable. So staggered is less stable, or eclipsed is more stable, staggered is less stable. Switch that. Eclipsed is higher energy, <laughs> stable is lower, staggered is lower energy, more stable. Staggered more stable, eclipsed less stable, staggered lower energy, eclipsed higher energy. So I want you to be able to talk about that in terms of higher energy and low energy, more stable and less stable. Yes. Yes, so you need more energy to put this here. Like if this molecule is existing in real life, molecules are always moving. They like vibrate and these bonds like stretch back and forth and they're rotating because they're just like groups of electrons around um, nucleus or like main centers, right? So they're just like always moving. Electrons don't just stay still, even in solid things, unless we're at absolute zero which means there's no energy at all in the system. Even solid things, the molecules in here are vibrating and moving. So um, when this is rotating around, it takes more energy. Like if it's hotter and you're putting more energy into this thing, it's easier to get it in this confirmation than when it's staggered. So hotter, more energy, you can do that. If there's less energy, it's more likely to be found in this. So yes, it takes more energy. You need more energy put into it to go into that position. Um, it probably will anyway, but it's just like less likely to go in there unless it has more higher energy source. So like say my water bottle, if I leave this out in the sun, the molecules in here are more likely to be able to get into that um, eclipsed notation or the eclipsed confirmation than if it's in this room. There's a higher percent of chance I would find it in eclipsed outside in my car than if I leave it in here. Yes. Well, actually part of that is because um, the molecules from the plastic can start to break down because you're putting enough energy in to break bonds sometimes. And so it can leach in. Um, that's more it. But Again, you're putting energy in, so it's rotating, moving, 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 and then able to push itself apart eventually and break. So that was a good question. I love the chemistry and real life question. But yeah, don't leave your Nalgene bottle in the sun. It's a bad idea. Don't leave it in your hot car. Don't leave it in hot places. We don't have the hot on our um, dishwasher. We don't leave the heat dry on at the end because we don't want our plastics leaching. So if you leave your water bottle in the car, any plastic bottle in the car with water in it, I would not drink that water. <laughs> That's my general policy. Except actually weirdly green. <laughs> There's like a study that showed that green Nalgene bottles are the best at absorbing um, the sun's wavelengths. And so they're less likely to break down. I thought that was interesting. I almost switched to a glass bottle and then I was like, mm, I'll break that. My life is more in danger with a glass bottle. Okay. Butane, for example, here is the sawhorse or the bond line wedge dash formation gone into the Newman projection formula. And then here is an example of conformational analysis. So we did like a casual conformational analysis of that first molecule I showed you. But now with this one, you can see the lowest energy conformation is when the biggest groups are on the opposite side from each other. So if you have two CH3 groups, those are the biggest. We want them on the opposite sides from each other. And then um, it will rotate. So basically you're just taking this through a rotation of a molecule all the way around until you've gone 360 degrees. So um, you're looking to draw the highest and lowest notations and you just pick one carbon to rotate. You only need one carbon to rotate. So this is butane. 
CH3, I didn't put all the hydrogens on there for easy visualization. CH2, CH2, CH3, pretend there's hydrogens there. They're implied hydrogens. <laughs> okay, so this is the lowest energy conformation of butane. And then we're picking one side and rotating it. If you try to rotate both the front and the back carbon, it's too confusing. So don't do that. So we're just going to rotate the front. This is the lowest energy conformation because the two big groups are on the opposite sides of each other. So this is the lower the temperature, the more likely are, you are to find this in this setting. And then if you rotate it 60 degrees, this is an eclipsed. You kind of have to, because this is curved, you have to kind of move it to get perfectly eclipsed. But see how you can't really see the back atoms? They're kind of covered up. Um, so they are very close together and there's a lot of repulsion. And if you can imagine this CH3 group also has three hydrogens off of it. And if you put one of those hydrogens back on here, it would be pretty easy for this hydrogen to be very close and these to be wanting to repulse each other. And there'd be two more of them, right? So um, this is a very a higher energy confirmation. And then you go back to a, a staggered confirmation. Is this as stable, do you think, as the very first one when they were anti to each other? No, not as stable. Higher energy because these two groups, even though they're staggered, are pretty are still pretty close together and they both have three hydrogens off of them. So that's a lot of electron density. Um, I think this is called gauche. Don't quote me on that. One of those is called gauche. I don't know if it's the left or the right. And then um, back to eclipsed. And this is, I think, sometimes called totally eclipsed. So the two biggest groups are next to each other. So this is the absolute highest energy confirmation. This takes the most energy. You would need it to be um, have a lot of energy source to get to be into this confirmation because it's not happy in this confirmation. And then this is roughly equivalent to when it was on the other side. Still not very stable, but more stable than if it's eclipsed, obviously. And then this is similar to when they were on. This side, you know, it's eclipsed, it's not happy, but it is better than it being fully eclipsed. And then we're back to where we started. So going through every single one of those steps is a confirmational analysis. Um, and so you can see they have labeled these one, two, three, four, five, and six. So gauche is when it's on either side. I guess I was thinking it'd be one or the other. I think gauche is the French word for left. Left or right? Does anyone know off the top of their head? So I always wanted to be that, but then I think I looked it up and it also means awkward. So that's why that's why gauche is when it's close to each other. It's because it's like an awkward confirmation, but not terrible. I think. Don't quote me on that. It's on record, so that's kind of a bummer. Um, okay, so you can see how we rotated to get to all these different confirmations. And then here's the overall confirmational analysis with the um, energy with it. So I'll have you recreate this with a different molecule today in your recitation work, um, where you will try to recreate this exact thing, but with a different molecule. So you'll need to know what is the absolute most stable energy. And that will be when the two biggest groups are opposite from each other. And then, um, You'll need to know when it's slightly, you know, when it's gauche, it'll be slightly less stable, but the eclipse ones are all significantly less stable. And the least stable eclipse is the total eclipse when they're completely on top of each other. Does that make sense to you? Do you have questions for me at this time? Okay, great. That makes me so happy. Um, anti is when they're perfectly opposite, gauche is when they're slightly off, and eclipse is when they're completely covered. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of it for Newman projection. I'm going to give you guys a practice problem right now where you have to go from a uh, bond line or the sawhorse to the Newman projection. So... And you can talk to each other about this. You don't have to do it completely by yourself. Actually, I'll do it on a fresh page.
Okay, and I want you to do it looking at it from this angle. So this is your little person with their little nose and their mouth. This is their eyeball, their creepy eyeball. They're looking from this angle. And so for me, you're gonna have to figure out which, what's easiest for you. For me, for some reason, I always imagine myself shrinking down to the size of a molecule. And if I was standing right here, what would I see? Um, but I don't know why that's easiest for me to visualize. Some people can rotate molecules in their mind. And if that works for you, you're incredible, but it does not work for me. So um, whatever works for you to visualize, that's what I want you to do. And I'll put this on here for you, but I'm not going to put it in the um, I'm not going to put it in the new introduction. So these are the ones in the thing of the page, and then here's your hypothesis. Once you have it, start drawing it in different companies. Start drawing it in a clip, start drawing it in a line. Start drawing it in all the different confirmations and start to label them as high energy and then low Okay, good job. I'm really proud of you. I saw a lot of y'all um, get it right. So if we put this up here on the um, visualizer in Newman projection, the chlorine's here. If I am visualizing the molecule, like I imagine myself standing right there, I can imagine the chlorine going straight down and two hydrogens up here, one on the left and one on the right. And then I have a CH3 coming up in the back. And then I imagine the two hydrogens coming down, one on the left and one on the right. Now I'm going to mess with you a little bit. Because I'm mean like that. Um, now I want you to draw this. So this will still be chlorine and this will still be CH3. We have a hydrogen and then we have an alcohol. And then we have, I guess I get to call this whatever I want. I don't know what the blue one is. Just to distinguish, we'll call that a um, bromine and then a hydrogen. Now it matters that now there's not just two hydrogens, it matters which side one goes on than the other. And we'll talk more about why it matters in chapter five.
Okay, I didn't specify, but I wanted you to look at it from the same angle. So that's from this side. So I think this one's a little bit more challenging, but if we turn it this way, you can see that the hydrogen is here on the left. The chlorine is going straight down and the bromine is over here on the right. And then if we go to the back, we have the CH3, an alcohol over here and a hydrogen on the right. So if I were to flip to where if you drawn it like this, that might not seem like a very big deal, right? Like, oh, well, you just flipped two things. Like that's not the end of the world, but it actually kind of is the end of the world. <laughs> not really. in, in your homework answers, maybe it would be the end of the world because you can't ever rotate this to get from here to there. Like this isn't a, this isn't a confirmation. No matter what we do, we can't have the bromine on the left and the hydrogen on the right. If the bromine's up here, then the chlorine's on the right. Do y'all see that? To get this confirmation, we would have to physically break a bond and put it back, which means this is a new molecule. Do you see that? Whenever you have to break bonds and then reattach them, that's a new molecule. So we saw that with cis trans, and then we're seeing it with this. So we don't want to talk about this a ton today, but um, molecules do, specifically molecules, carbons with four things around them, have handedness. So there's like a left and right hand to the molecule and, and you can't always overlay it perfectly. So in this case, if you drew this backwards and flipped it, it might seem like the same molecule because all the same things are attached and it's not that big of a deal. But in actuality, you drew a different molecule. You drew the right-hand version instead of the left-hand or whatever. Does that make sense? So when you're doing um, bond line wedge dash to Newman projection, you have to get the wedges and the dashes right. And if you're looking at it from this side, they might be on the right. The wedges might be look like they're coming out of the page. So they're on this side. If it's on the left, the wedges might be on this side. You have to pay attention to that. You have to be able to visualize the molecule. And you can always make your modeling kit, but on the exam, you're gonna have what, like 17 multiple choice questions and three or four free response questions. You won't have time to make a model for every single one. So you need to get quick at being able to accurately go from the bond line notation to the Newman projection. Okay, so that's, just another way that we kind of work on visualizing molecules for you. The next thing we're going to talk about is the 3D shapes of molecules in rings. Um, so cycloalkane, uh, cycloalkanes are actually not very good at making rings. They're not happy and they're not stable when they're in rings um, because of something called ring strain. And ring strain is made up of two different types of strain. And when I say strain, what I mean is um, maybe like electron repulsion, like they're working, they're straining to be in that position. So they're made up of two different types of ring strain. Um, the ring strain is made up of two different types of strain, angle strain and torsional strain. And I think you've heard of angle strain before, have you? What's angle strain? Does somebody wanna take a guess? Anyway. Yes, exactly. The molecules are tightly packed together because they um, they can't be in 109.5 anymore. They have to be all tied to each other. So I'm going to show you what I mean just as soon as I can get this model built. Okay, so molecules like to be 109.5, right? That's how far, if there's four things bonded to it, they want your angles to be as 109.5 apart. We talked about that, the tetrahedral wants 109.5. Now go all the way back to geometry. If you're in an equilateral triangle, do you remember what this angle is? I heard it, 60. 60 is not 109.5, right? So the, these bonds are made up of clouds of electrons. They're not just like lines that are close together. 
these clouds of electrons are being forced to be very close together and they're not happy about it. <laughs> they don't want to be very close together. So um, they're mad, okay? The other kind of strain, the one called torsional strain, is actually, if you look this way, I'm going to put it up on here. I think that'll be better. If you, because that way people who aren't physically here can see. If you look this way, what confirmation is this in? Staggered or eclipsed? This is eclipsed. Is eclipsed happy? No. And it can't get out of the eclipsed confirmation because if it tries to rotate, these hydrogens are going to start interacting. So it's trapped in an eclipse confirmation and it's not happy about it. So that's that's ring strain and torsional strain. So ring strain is we're not in 109.5 anymore. That sucks. And torsional strain is we um, have to be in eclipse confirmation and that also sucks. And I've got the purples on top with um, or the hydrogens on top with purple bonds for a reason, which I will talk to you about as we go through. I think you kind of saw that visualization if you watched the video already. Okay. So you already saw cyclopropane. SP3 hybridized carbon wants to be 109.5. This isn't 109.5. It's mad. It's like 60. So that's significantly deviated from the angle. And then also they're eclipsed. And that's not happy either. Cyclobutane is actually able to bend a little bit. So it can try to get closer. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, would you mind me wrapping this part up? And then, okay, great. You can actually try to get closer to the um, to the less eclipsed confirmation. So you can try to bend the ring to where it has more space, so less uh, ring strain and less torsional strain. So it will, if it's in this flat, what we've always imagined rings to be, I think, you can see there's a lot of that eclipsed situation. And there's a lot of, these are all 90 degrees, but it can kind of try to bend up and these go down. And that way there's less eclipsed. See how that's no longer eclipsed? So they can kind of shift to where it's not perfectly flat anymore. It doesn't look like that flat planar ring that we've imagined, but it relieves some of its strain. It's not perfect, but it can relieve some of its strain. Okay, and um, so it's not planar, it's slightly folded. If it was planar, the strain would be less the ring the angle strain would be but the torsional strain so that's the like eclipse strain would be more so it tries to free itself a little bit from that cyclopentane kind of does the same thing where it breaks out of a planar position um, but the one that we're going to spend the most time on is a six-membered ring and i'm going to have dr corrales present to you and then we'll do a quick class break and then we'll talk about the six membered ring and that gives me time to build this Perfect. so you guys know dr corrales they Hi. were the person who i gave you the test gave you the test okay. yes Hi, and they're also Kelly. my colleague and they're also coming to talk to you about the thing that i post the announcement for yesterday where you can yes. contribute to science contribute to science so i do chemistry education research here and i also teach organic chemistry um during the fall and spring and I am recruiting students like you who are taking OCHEM 1 right now um, to participate in a study for about 40 to 60 minutes uh, with me. You would just come into the lab, do a few organic chemistry related tasks. Um, I would record those and get that information and then use that for my research. Um, all of it is confidential. So once I get that recording and all that information, only I would see that and it would not be associated with your name. And then it would help a lot with our research and better understanding how students learn chem um, organic chemistry and how to better teach organic chemistry. Um, you'll also get a $25 Amazon gift card if you hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's like it's that's not, twenty five dollars for like an hour of your time talk for an hour, hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's fully voluntary. Dr. Clooney won't know if you participate or not. It's all confidential, but it would help me out a lot. Um, I also do research with Dr. Atkinson. You might have had her for Gen Chem, um, but together we um, do education research in different parts of chemistry, just trying to be better educators and making our classes better. So if you are interested, Dr. Clooney put the link on Canvas already. So if you go on there, you just have to answer a few questions. They're just like screening questions, like how many times have you taken OCHEM? Like what's your age? What's your 
you're in school, those types of questions just so I can get the information about you. And then I will follow up with an email scheduling an interview um, to do the organic chemistry task. And that'll probably be by the end of the week or next week. And it only takes an hour of your time. So if you are interested, I would highly recommend you fill that out. You can even fill it out right now. If we're taking a little break, mm -hmm. that would be amazing. Um, and also, if you have any questions, you can email me. You can email Dr. Sweeney, and she can pass on that email to me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so if you would like to do that, that would be awesome. You're doing me a huge favor because I really need more students. So, yeah. And I just want to say um, a few things. One, this does take place in my office upstairs. Uh, you've probably seen uh, there's like a little room where people go back into. If you sign up to be in this study, um, I don't have to be in the room. Dr. Corrales can tell me to leave, and I will absolutely honor that because I want you to feel totally comfortable. So I really won't know if yeah. you do it or not. It really is confidential. We are regulated by a review board that makes sure that I won't know because I'm not on that study. So I am legally not allowed to know who takes it. I will leave the room. Um, and also, I really want to encourage you guys to do it because, you know, if people hadn't participated in these kinds of studies, I wouldn't have been able to get my PhD, right? Mm -hmm. Plus, $25 for an hour, that's like more than I make teaching this class. You would get the money right away. You don't have to wait. Mm -hmm. I can't be on your way out. And you can be wrong or right, and it does not matter. We just want to know how you think. That's what we care about. Yeah, and as far as confidentiality, I do block off time in the calendar, so Dr. Cleaning will know not to come in. Mm -hmm. So it all kind of works out that she won't be there, and we can do the study, get money, everybody's happy, I get some data for my research. There you go. Is that it? And then the very last thing I was going to say is if you've taken it before, I have someone who who has taken OCHEM before and they participated in the study, can they take it again? No, I only need students who have not done the study before. Okay, and then my other question was, um, is everyone who filled out guaranteed to get a spot so they can earn the $25? Or do you select randomly? Um, I select randomly okay. until I have enough, but depending on how many people sign up, it's usually everybody who signs up gets to do it. So <laughs> it ends up working out fine. And even if you don't go to UNT as your main university, we still want you to be willing to sign up so yes, that we can learn please. about your thought processes. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, that brings us into class break time. Um, I'm going to run upstairs because I realized I forgot the cups for recitation. We'll finish up talking about, I love the cups. Do you guys like the cup system? Like it. Mm, okay. Um, so I'll run up and get those and then be back. Take your break. And at 12 o'clock, we'll reconvene. We'll finish up stuff about cyclohexane and then we'll go to recitation. Thank you. And feel free to use this time to fill out the link. I saw your little snap. I didn't know if you were doing that. Yeah, I was doing that. I mean, there's only one of me, and mm -hmm. so I was like, "This is totally perfect." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't have a list. Take a packet order.
about the water body thing. I was interested but I don't want to that. So let's say that we're outside mm -hmm. all day long mm -hmm. and yeah. you know just like the heat every day. Does that count? Okay. Probably not great, but probably not as bad as being in town because the whole greenhouse kind of thing. Um I still risk it because although BPA and BPA like molecules, which BPA molecules, BPA free molecules have, um, although they're not great, there's not a ton of research. It's like this is horrible for you. It's just like minimized exposure. So like I don't touch a lot of those deep cool molecules because they have BPA, and I don't eat a lot of canned foods because it has BPA, and then I risk it on my water bottles. I like reduce my BPA consumption in other ways. 
and then I have my water bottle and I just mostly keep it. That's what I mean. That's how I heard it. Because I'm just like lazy. I did summer band for four years, and then I did drum corps. And then I really did that. Like, that's what it's how, we, how, how dead am I in the future? You're probably not in the future. You probably will have another, probably our terrible diet that we have will get us before our plastic too. But just like try to minimize, I don't, I try not to fear malware, but I try to minimize that. So you know, thing. I was just like thinking, and I was like, oh my God. I did the same thing. Actually, so we'll probably I kind just of both have grown up together. But, probably. But I do think that there's a lot of other things that we should worry about more than just plastic too. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, I agree. I still obviously agree. I mean, yeah. as you can see, you said yeah. green, and I was like, green. So <laughs> I was like, yeah, well, I'm, I'm uh, doing pretty good. <laughs> yes, I really think it's it's minimal. But I now that I know, I'm like, oh, these are simple ways I can reduce my exposure to a chemical that we don't want. It's come out in like more in the last forty years, right? So knowing that, then I do anything I can to minimize my exposure to that, but I don't panic about it all the time. Okay, I know. Okay. Yeah, Thank that's you. my that's my thought process. Because there's okay. so many chemicals also that we interact with on a regular basis that we don't know about. Did you know like Diet Coke didn't even come out for the '80s? Yeah. So people just drink it like we know what it does to us. Yeah. We don't really. <laughs> I don't know. I did a, an experiment in high school that I was trying to prove to my friend that Diet Coke is bad to you, and I simulated the. Um, like your the acid in your stomach uh -huh. and it was disgusting and yeah. now I'm drinking like oh. yeah <laughs> see there's a lot of stuff like that we just don't know about that I try to be careful about like. I would say like vaccines don't fall into that category, right? Because there's a ton of scientific research that goes into it before they put it out for consumption. Um, Diet Coke, I'm like, how much research did we really do and how much of that was funded by people who make money from selling Diet Coke? All of it. <laughs> yeah. And same thing with like radium when it first came out and they were using radium to like paint watches and stuff. Like, I saw in the, uh, also on their last exam, I mean, not the last exam, though, the practice exam said something that you know on there. And I was thinking because I had David Carr in the fall. I don't know if I was Um, I mean, in the spring. Um, but um, she'll test you over those dumb things when I say don't. Yeah, it's, it's a thousand miles. Thalidomide. We're gonna yeah, talk that, about that. That I thought about it. And I was like, actually, that's our. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that too. So, yep. I thought about it. And I was like, actually, that would be well. So, <laughs> Okay, let's bring it back in. We're gonna finish up cyclohexane rings and then go into recitation. I don't want to panic you also about your water bottle. It's probably fine. I just am careful about my exposure to leach plastics. Okay, don't panic. I'm not a fear monger. I'm just an informer. I clearly still risk it with my water bottle. I didn't switch to glass because I feel like I'm more likely to hurt myself the other way. But I just try to minimize my exposure to things that there's not a lot of research on. Okay. Um, and BPA free doesn't mean anything. They just change BPA to some other molecule that acts exactly like BPA, and we still don't know anything about it. So don't pay more for BPA free. It doesn't mean anything. Okay. Um, I I saw a TikTok yesterday that this guy was like, "There's chemicals in everything, but look, you can just make these muffins with bananas and eggs and blueberries." And I was like. Though so I get what he's saying, but those are all chemicals too. Like just say harmful. Just say there's harmful chemicals. That's all you have to say, harmful. Chemicals are not inherently bad. And a lot of chemicals are fine in small amounts, like fluoride when you brush your teeth really helps your teeth strength and bad in large amounts. Like if you consume a lot of fluoride, it's bad for you. So don't buy into chemical-free blueberries or whatever they're selling to you on the internet. Okay, rant over. So um, <laughs> the next ring I want to show you is cyclohexane. And you guys probably saw, a lot of you said you saw my video on this. Honestly, I posted that announcement and like scheduled it ahead of time. So I don't 100% remember which videos I gave you, but we're going to talk about why cyclohexane lives in boat and chair conformation. So if cyclohexane was just a flat planar ring like this. Look at all that strain. There's like, all these are overlapping. All of these are in the eclipse formation, which is less stable. And this angle is actually not as bad as some of the other ones. It's closer to tetrahedral, but it's not perfect, right? So there's still a lot of torsional strain. It's not the best. So to relieve the torsional strain primarily, cyclohexane occupies what we call most of the time, it also occupies a different 
confirmation, but most of the time it occupies what we call chair confirmation. And chair is kind of a loose interpretation. I think of it as like those, you know, those beach chairs where it's like, here's your headrest, here's where you lay, and then your feet kind of go down. Or like if you're getting your nails done and it can like lean back and the massage chairs or whatever, that kind of thing where it's not like a full chair that you would sit in, but you can kind of see that it's, it's sort of cherry, sort of like a chair. Anyway, and um, some key features about this, we're gonna pretend all these are hydrogens, but I kind of wanted to show you the, um, the difference here between the other way. You can see there are three of them that point straight up. Those and these that point straight down are axial. And then the ones on the outside are equatorial. And they're alternating equatorial pointing up or pointing down, I guess, depending on how you look at it. Up, down, up, down, up. And you can kind of see all of the white atoms, all of the white hydrogens here are pointing up either at a light angle in the equatorial position or at a strong angle in the axial position. And then, um, on the ones pointing down, they're all pointing down either at a slight angle, all the purple and green ones at a slight angle or a serious angle. So you can kind of see that. Did we talk about cis trans bonds yet in rings? No, okay. I think that was in the last part of chapter four and I changed it. So you've seen cis trans in, um, in this form a lot. Like this is trans and this is cis, right? But in rings, we use cis and trans to talk about um, which side is pointing up or down. Because even though it's a single bond, like I said, it can't rotate all the way because it starts to hit the other thing and it'll mess up the shape. So um, when you're in your flat formation, if you can imagine it, all these would be wedges coming towards you and all these would be dashes going away from you. So this white and this green are trans to each other. These two whites are cis to each other. So that's another way that you can think of cis-trans bonds, okay? Cis and trans, though, as you saw when I moved this into chair conformation, are not the same as axial and equatorial because all the ones that point up are cis to each other. All the ones that point down are cis to each other. If you have an up and down, that's trans. But you can have... Here, as you can see, let me get this closer. You can see there's two that are um, trans to each other, two pointing down that are in equatorial, or two pointing down that one's equatorial, one axial. Same thing if you have trans, both of these are in equatorial. And if you have trans here, uh, or sorry, trans here, one of these is X. No, yeah, these are both equatorial. And then trans here, one's equatorial and one's axial. So cis and trans are not the same thing as axial and equatorial. So get that out of your mind. Don't ever let it enter it. A lot of students get that into their mind and they try to memorize these rules about if it's cis-trans here, then it's axial or equatorial. If it's cis-trans here, they're both equatorial. Don't do that to yourself. Learn the axial and equatorial positions and learn cis-trans, learn how to go between them. They're not the same thing. Okay, so this is the form that cyclohexane likes to take, the chair form. It's the most stable form, and you can see that's because these hydrogens are all are all axial, whereas if it was in boat or another form, there's a lot more eclipse. So it bends up into this chair form. You will never have to draw these Newman projections of the six-membered ring. That's way too advanced for this class, but just to show you it. And the boat conformation is less stable than the chair because it's eclipsed, and it has what they call flagpole interaction. So here, uh, oh. I wish I could do split screen, but I don't want to. Here you can see these interact, but they're pretty far apart. So these interactions aren't significant. If it goes into the boat conformation, there's four of them that are all pointing up, and all of these are interacting with each other. And that's not good. And then these are also pretty close together. So it's better to have the three farther apart than four. So that's what they mean when they say flagpole interactions are the ones that are pointing up. And I think they say flagpole because it's a boat. So theoretically you would have flags on a boat. So these three interactions are better than when you had four up there. 
And then there's also something called a twist boat. So that shows you the one four flagpole interactions. And then these four are eclipsed. Twist boat is lower than pier boat, but it's still not as good as chair. So just don't worry about those. It'll live in the chair confirmation because it's the lowest energy. And then this is, you won't have to do this either, but I just want you to see the conformational energy diagram for a six membered ring. It's the same idea as from the Newman projection, but you can see how much more stable it, the chair is than the half chair. Twist boats a little bit, boats even, it's not as good as a half chair, but yeah. So these are all the different confirmations. You don't need to know them. It really just shows you why we think about cyclohexane being in a chair confirmation and not being like flat or anything else. So I circled those chair confirmations, those are the best. So there's axial hydrogen atoms, those are, or whatever your substituent is, that are, um, the axial are either up or down in a vertical orientation. So these three up, these three down, they're vertical up and down. They're not going to be angled at all. When you draw that, you need to be able to represent that. And then equatorial, these alternate pointing up and down. They're all angled slightly up or down. So you need to be able to recreate that when you draw it. Um, equatorial is more stable because it has more space around it. So if you're trying to decide what conformation is the most stable, you're gonna have your biggest, bulkiest groups in the equatorial position. Um, so there's kind of two different chair forms. Like you can go from here, called a ring flip. You can go from, um, I'll just show you, I'm gonna change one molecule in here so you can visualize it. Um, you can see here, this is an equatorial position, but I can go through a ring flip and push that into the axial position. So this is just a different confirmation. And this would be less stable because it's interacting with these other hydrogens. So this big bulky group has more interaction. When it's out in that equatorial position, it has a lot less interactions. There's not as much stuff around it. So that's why equatorial is more stable because it's further away. It has more energy or more room for its electrons to hang out in. So substituted cyclohexane could either be equatorial or axial. The larger the um, G is just like a group. That's why it says G. I don't know why they didn't just use R. The larger the R group, the uh, more severe the axial interactions are, so the more important it is for it to be an equatorial. So there's actually the tert butyl group that you learned about. That is like the quintessential bulky group. It's huge, and we use it all the time as a bulky group. And that bulkiness makes it to where um, if there is a tert butyl on your cyclohexane ring, that tert butyl almost will never switch into the axial position as a confirmation. It's so large. And those interactions would be so bad that it is almost frozen where the um, the big bulky group is in the equatorial position. So we normally can see confirmations going back and forth where we go axial, equatorial, axial, equatorial, but it spends the most time in the most stable position. If there's a tert butyl group, it can't go really back and forth. It's kind of like stuck. It has to be in the equatorial position because it's so big. So that's what it means by the larger the group, the more severe the interaction is. The larger the group, the more likely it is that you'll find it in the equatorial position in real life when it's switching back and forth between confirmations. Okay, and then, oh, here's our cis trans strikes again. I called it that because you guys hated cis trans so much. <laughs> You're all like, I don't see it. Um, so cis trans strikes again. So you can kind of see where we talk about trans being on opposite sides and cis being on the same side of the molecule. Cis and trans is not the same as axial and equatorial. So as you can see, these two can both be axial. These two can both be equatorial as trans. And then this um, in the same position, one's axial, one's equatorial, one's axial, one's equatorial as cis. But these as cis, one's equatorial, one's axial, one's axial, one's equatorial, this ring would almost not exist because that torpedo group is so big. So cis here, we have one axial, one equatorial. Cis here, we have both equatorial. So you see that cis and trans are not the same thing as axial and equatorial, but you need to be able to convert between the two and we'll talk about how to do that. Okay, so did you have a question? Yeah. 
I speak for the business. We'll talk about it. the difference. But I can show you one more time uh, if you think it'll help you. Let's go back to the visualizer. So, and I'll show you how to go back and forth between the two. So I'm just going to pick two. I'm going to pick two molecules to make them be, or two atoms. Okay, so see um, all these three are pointing up and these three are pointing down in chair confirmation. You see it? Okay, so if these are on the same side, so they're both attached to the purple wedges, these are cis to each other because they're both on the purple wedges. If we had our flat, I think it's easier for students to visualize it in the flat form for cis and trans. You can see that these are both clearly pointing up. They're on the same side of the ring. So they're cis. You couldn't break this bond and flip these two. If we did that, it would be a new molecule and that would be trans. But they're both attached to purple. So they're cis. Do you guys all agree with that? Awesome. So we could put these both in the axial position. Is that going to be more or less stable than if they're both in equatorial? Less. Great. So these can both be in axial position or they can both be in equatorial position. Um, see that? Now they're both in equatorial position. They're still attached to purple bonds. They're still pointing slightly up. So that's why they're still cis to each other. No matter what axial or equatorial position they're in, they're cis. Okay. But if you made one four be cis instead of one three, so carbons one, two, three, and four now. Again, we can see they're attached to purple bonds. They're pointing up. Let's see. One, two. Sorry, it takes a second to get into chair confirmation. They're still attached to purple bonds. They're still both slightly pointing up, but one's axial and one's equatorial. So these are still cis, but one's axial, one's equatorial. So just because something is cis does not mean they're both axial or they're both equatorial. Cis just means they'll both be pointing slightly up or slightly down. And depending on their arrangement in the ring, if they're at one, two, one, three, one, four, like depending on how far apart they are, that's what changes to make it be axial equatorial, not the cis trans. And we'll go through on your recitation packet, you actually like go through and you draw cis one, two, cis one, four, like you'll go through all those things. Okay. We're almost done with notes and then you can have at it in recitation, I promise. Okay, so um, that's cis, cis one, two dye substituted. As you can see, one's axial, one's equatorial, but in the one before, if we had two that were cis, they were both um, on the same axial equatorial position. That's all I'm trying to say. Like these are trans and they're both axial or they're both equator equatorial. And these are, I think these are trans also. No, those are cis, but it's hard for me to tell when they're in this confirmation, right? But this one's pointing up, that one's pointing down. So these are trans and one's axial, one's equatorial. These are trans and they're both equatorial. Okay. So um, that's it for psychoalkanes and for um, confirmations. You're gonna practice that in your recitation today. Um, low, so usually alkanes have a really low reactivity. If you think about their pKa, right? So what's the pKa of alkanes? 50, what's alkynes? 25 and alkenes are 45. I put them out of order to mess with y'all. <laughs> So they don't usually react unless there's heat or pressure or some kind of energy making them react. But alkenes will react a little bit more easily. You can convert them to alkanes. And um, this is a pretty simple reaction, but it basically um, goes from having double bonds to deleting double bonds. And have do you guys know about margarine? Margarine is what? What do you say? Not butter, that's right, it's not butter. It's oil that's been hydrogenated. And what hydrogenated literally means is it's deleted the double bonds in the hydrogenation. So uh, in the 
alkane chain. And the reason some things are oil at room temperature and some things are solid at room temperature like butter is because of this unsaturation. So if you can imagine, if you had a bunch of molecules that were fully saturated with hydrogen, so all your carbons had full hydrogen saturation, it takes us a beautiful tetrahedral shape, right? That we've seen over and over. And if all of you, if your oil, which is strongly nonpolar, long carbon chains, all have that same thing, they can stack in together really nicely and very easily make a crystalline shape with their um, intermolecular forces, right? This, uh, this has like a very consistent uh, dispersion pattern so that it's really easy for these to lock in. This is like a little bit of what butter looks like on the molecular level. But if you can imagine having an alkene in the middle of it, these are gonna be much hard to stack in nicely. It's gonna be much harder to have consistent dispersion forces between them. And so it's not gonna be as packedly tight, tightly packed, and so it'll be oil at room temperature. So um, literally molecular interactions explain why some things are butter and some things are oil, right? Some things are solid, some things are not. And if you put heat into it, you can overcome those intermolecular forces. And what does butter start to do? melt and that's why you keep butter in the fridge if you want it to be hard and butter out if you want it to be soft. So hydrogenation literally tries to get rid of these double bonds so that at the molecular level it can pack more easily and you can have margarine which is a butter that's solid at room temperature. In that process commercially though and I have not figured this out and I've tried to find it out um, sometimes the naturally occurring cis double bond in um, oil like olive oil when you try to hydrogenate them, sometimes they can be converted to trans double bonds. And I don't know why. I think it's kind of like an industry secret. I've tried to get in there and figure it out, and I can't. And that's when you hear about trans fats in margarine. Trans fats literally mean it's switched from a cis bond to a trans bond. And trans fats are the ones that are bad for you. Okay? Yes. Do you have a question? Oh, I thought I saw your hand go up. So this molly or this reaction is one that literally gets used in industry all the time. And it also is like a gimme on your exam that you'll have this because all that happens is you have H2 and some kind of metal and it will delete your double bond and turn it into an alkane. <laughs> so if you're ever trying to figure out what a reaction does and you see H2 um, metal and heat or pressure or heat and pressure, it just gets rid of your pi bond and turns it into a sigma bond of hydrogen. And um, you can just kind of memorize this. Here's a few practice for you to see what happens. But I want to show you real quick, like what it actually looks like on the molecular level. Is the hydrogen atoms, you have your metal. So let's say we have um, nickel. So you have like a plate of nickel. And uh, I think they can use that nickel, like the hydrogen atoms use the nickel to draw the negative charges up towards them. So all of these are little hydrogen atoms that line up on your nickel or whatever the metal is. And then your double bond comes down and it picks up two, like it just comes down and picks up two hydrogen atoms and then goes on its way. But it needs heat and pressure to do that because it's not very reactive. So yeah, that's hydrogenation. And that's your first uh, not acid base reaction that you're learning in chemistry. So that's exciting. Um, and that's all of chapter four. So you can see why I broke up chapter four nomenclature and chapter four shapes of molecules because they seem like they kind of don't go together at all, but you are responsible for all of it. Um, and now we get to do 25 minutes of recitation, 15 minutes of recitation, and go for it. We're done with chapter four. Uh, make sure you turn in one of your recitation packets and get all three colors. I dropped something so they're out of order. Yes. Oh, yes. The quiz is just over chapter four. I had chapter three in there because I was like, I don't know if we'll finish chapter three before the exam, but we did. So I don't think I have a good chapter three. It'll just be chapter four. And this is a lot, right? You just learned a whole new language system and you're learning how to visualize molecules. So it's a lot. Okay, go for it. Yes. No, don't 
learn that consistently because it depends on which way you're showing it. So if it's if you're trying to draw this one and say you drew it flat like this and the wedge is coming towards you, then if you looked at it, it's on the right. But if you look at it from this angle, it's on the left. So don't just memorize that. It depends on which way you're showing it. Okay. It'll tell you. There's a ah, I, There's usually the little eye drawn on there. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> 